Hello and welcome back. I'm Ray Gibson from Art27. Art27 is a platform for artists, arts educators and arts ed organisations working in Europe and beyond for sharing stories, cultural programmes and raising awareness of the power of the arts as a force for social change and social inclusion. And this is our panel discussion kicking off in a moment on today, November 16th, 2020, International Day for Tolerance. And we are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so if you have questions, you can put them in the Facebook chat and we will pick them up and do our best to answer. And I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves now. Um, we have John Speyer, Hannes Siebert, who's on the road. <laughs> and uh, Inga, forgive me, Inga, you might have to help me pronounce your family name. Inga Koistermans? Perfect. Oh, wow. Okay, lucky. So, <laughs> um, so if I may ask, uh, starting with John, um, can you give us a, a few minutes introduction of, um, you know, where you come from, what you're working on, help our audience get to know you, please. Hi, hi, I'm John Speyer, and I'm director at Music in Detention, which is a small UK charity. We do music making in with people detained in immigration detention centres in the UK. And we work to improve their well-being um, and to build empathy and understanding between them and people outside detention in the wider community. So that would be the peace building part, if you like, particularly of the work. Um, in my spare time, I'm also involved with a project in South Yorkshire, which uses a special form of dialogue to uh, engage with people who are living in local communities where there is lots of worry about migration mm -hmm. and uh and lots of community tension so okay. so there's a sort of there's another bit of peace building in my uh, yeah um i i support that in a voluntary capacity so i i thought of thought i'd mention that because it might come into the conversation i suspect all right thank you john and you have an interesting heritage if i understand this well from polish dutch spanish um, yeah, my granddad, my, my granddad, my paternal granddad was uh, Dutch. All so right. I, um, I'm kind of a little bit Dutch. The name Speyer is a, was a, yeah. was a common Jewish name, I think, right. in Amsterdam before the war. So, yeah, but my, my I'm, a, I'm a Jew whose family came from all over the place, really. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome. <laughs> and um, uh, Hannah Siebert, um, you're perhaps in the car. On the way, you're a man of action today. Um, you, you run um, peace negotiations, as I understand, and I think we, we've caught you between negotiations. Is that right? Um, I'm arrived. Uh, I okay. just came came from one town on the border to another one. Uh, okay. Yeah, my day job is uh, peace negotiations, ceasefire negotiations, and help with... Uh, design and setup of uh, of dialogues at uh, at the beginning and the end of a war and the beginning of a peace process um, yeah. and then obviously a bit of um, uh, um, uh, looking also at the architecture of peace processes but my background until early 2000 uh, mm -hmm. was in media. I was first a newspaper editor and then a filmmaker. And that's how I got into mm. peace processes um, in wow. my own country in South Africa. From the and so, um, it, the, the, the first phase was really, um, they pulled us in to see if we can help uh, design the media and communications uh, programs in the South African peace process um, and and since then I've done it in a few other countries in Asia and in the Middle East uh, assist particularly with the design of peace architecture um, mm. and also focusing on the media um, I have a few slides you can look at quickly um, that would be good now yeah, as, a, yeah. as an introduction uh, the second slide there you see a bunch of hands um, it was an advert uh, um, I don't know if we're looking at it or... Uh, it's coming through now, yeah. If we go to the second slide. Um, yeah, so that, that, that was a, 
advert from the South African peace process of how do we move from from uh, fighting towards uh, uh, the peace process. The third slide, you'll see the elements that we look at the next slide. Um, which look at really across the media, how do we use um, from baby powder boxes to soap boxes to uh, television programs, radio programs, newspaper supplements, get the newspapers to work together. Because part of in every conflict that we that you see where they, it is a civil war or like the South African uh, anti-apartheid fight, um, uh, the media becomes part of the problem, and and how do we how do we break those stereotypes? And I think media and art is one of the most powerful ways mm. to break those stereotypes. And that was part of the research and uh, programming that we did. That we felt also we're not going to look at uh, ghettoize piece art, uh, but actually produce mainstream media and art and television. Um, that compete and fill the space in uh, peak hour times and and proper television and and print and other times. So the South African one is a bit old. Um, you know, it gives away my age. Right? Um, so it is a it's an old program. Um, if I can go to the next slide, um, the fourth slide shows a little bit of the television programs we've done, uh, youth programs, talk shows, uh, radio shows, exchanges. Um, the next one, if you go, um, the next slide uh, is a little bit, uh, I've moved in the late uh, 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 2000s uh, away from media and became more actively involved as a facilitator and, and helping with ceasefire negotiations and, and the design and build of dialogues and peace processes. But I felt quite compelled that the narrative, what, what disturbed me is the narrative of the children in each one who suffers the most and who are really the true reflections of the divide. And, and it was particularly interesting to watch uh, and follow the children's art and, and help to create spaces for children's art, children's interactive theater, children, uh, wall art, uh, any form of art, uh, music, uh, and so forth. And mm -hmm. so in Sri Lanka and Cyprus and Syria and Burma and Lebanon, um, we, we focused a lot on um, in my evenings and weekends to, to really support the artists from each of those countries to help. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you know, the, the, the intolerance of the war uh, playoff inside the refugee communities with children or it, it's leftovers in schools um, mm -hmm. and the trauma is there. So. Uh, if you if we just scroll through the rest, I wouldn't have to talk about it. You will see the next slide. Um, you will see some uh, some wall art yeah. uh, here in Asia, um, uh, the, and Asia and Syria uh, there. And the next slide, um, you will see. A, 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 sorry, it's a drawing of mm -hmm. two soldiers but they shoot and where they connect becomes a flower. It's a kid, it's a drawing from a, a child in uh, Nepal uh, that is one of the, in one of the orphanages wow. there. Um, the next one um, uh, is Syria Interactive Theater uh, in the refugee camps where Syrian actors and directors and musicians are working. The art is from Cyprus. Um, and it's been really extraordinary to see how the Syrian actors and musicians has uh, played a significant role mm. uh, in, in these and, and, and very, you know, a little bit support have helped them a great yeah. deal forward. And the last slide um, briefly is just, uh, it's a slide of the different religions and some of the truths in there. 
Uh, but this slide had quite interesting impact in places like Sri Lanka, here in Myanmar, uh, and elsewhere, where you take the essence of the messages and that go into forms of art from the different uh, communities. I just put the messages up there. I couldn't, I didn't have enough time to find for you all the art and the newspaper supplements that no, uh, came really, out of there. But it was really shows. powerful to just take the common language of the different religions mm. that just go up. Because you sit, we sit in the middle of each of these conflicts. Um, and I think the, the quote for me always of Michel Grosowski, the, the, he was the son of a Jewish rabbi in Israel. And he always said, where do we stand as peacemakers or artists in a conflict? And he said, as an artist and a journalist, I stand in the middle. I'm not standing in no man's land of neutrality. I stand in the middle where the conflict is most intense and where I can reach out mm. and touch both sides. And I stand there on compassion and love and, and justice and truth. Um, and I found that always a really extraordinary um, quote from him, mm. being a son of a rabbi and, and in wow. Israel and Palestine. So thank you. That's my introduction. Good thank long. you. Yeah, thanks for sharing those slides as well and putting those together. That's great. We'll come back to some of those themes, particularly on the media side. Um, Inga, uh, thanks for being very patient. Um, could you tell us about yourself and what you're working on, please? Yes, I'm Inge Kustermans. Uh, I'm working on, I'm running the Festival Academy. We offer peer learning to festival managers worldwide. Um, basically from the belief or, or the way that we see festivals is that they are not islands, but they are connected to what is going on in the world. Mm. So the idea is basically that um, from sharing perspectives and listening to each other's stories, uh, from people who come from very different perspectives and backgrounds, we can raise awareness, uh, compete ignorance and uh, act from festivals. So it's really a reflection on the role of festivals in today's society. And I think as, as the UN Secretary uh, Antonio Guterres said, like, people are not born to hate, which refers to Nelson Mandela's quote so intolerance is learned and thus it can be prevented and unlearned so it's basically from that principle that uh, from listening and, and really hearing about mm. each other's circumstances we can care more and be more informed and aware right okay, thank you. by the way a community of 700 festival managers from more than 90 countries and all continents wow so they are a um... Yeah, a great sample set, let's say, of what's going on. Okay. Um, and let's stay with you, Inga, if we may. So um, what, one of the first questions we'd like to bring up in, in this panel discussion is, you know, where do you see intolerance in your work and also in your social life? Well, I think in, on, on, with the work of the Festival Academy, we are confronted with a lot of levels of intolerance. In 2015, we had to cancel our atelier, our physical atelier that was supposed to take place in Kampala because of the gay law that was voted there at that point. We have a lot of people who come from um, regions where freedom of expression is repressed. We had uh, at the Valletta Atelier in 2017, a keynote speaker, Shaidul Alam, uh, who is a Bangladesh photographer and actually the initiator of the first photography festival in Bangladesh who was locked up for weeks on end without a trial um, because he reported on the student protests in Bangladesh at that point. And he was actually freed thanks to um, the social media and the international network that he had uh, managed to, to create. So at a certain point, he had been initiated. So on all these levels, or also on the level of visa, we are working globally. So people have to travel from different countries to places we had many issues where people were not allowed to travel and not because of uh, real reasons, but on the basis of where they came from, um, mainly targeting also Arab regions, uh, things like that when we had an atelier in Hungary. So yeah, I think uh, on many levels, this is reflected in the work that we are doing. Mm. So a lot of yeah, restricted movement, um, restricted expression, um, yeah, and, and the inability to report, okay. Um, and then can we 
uh, move to you, please, John. Um, where do you see intolerance in, in your work and also um, in, in your own life as you move around and, and be a citizen of the world? Mm. Um, yeah, you asked me this question in, a, in the earlier session. Um, I'm going to give a different answer this time. <laughs> Great, yeah. <laughs> um, I, in my work, I don't feel that I see huge levels or sort of virulent levels of intolerance. And I think I can think of two reasons for that. I mean, Pete, you know, I hear I hear a lot of misconceptions. I hear I hear comments that that categorize people, that racialize them. But avert expressions of hatred, not really. And 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 I I attribute this to two things. Firstly, I think the detention system, which is hugely problematic, which really messes up people's lives in a in a huge way, uh, shows to us its better side, because we're the guys who go in and make music, and you know we we work with people who work in the system whose job it is to organise activities and this kind of thing. Um, so we you know detention centers are complex places where where um bad things definitely happen but good things can happen too and because people we're on the good side so we don't tend not to see so much of the bad side and then the other reason i think is that detention is a system so it, it you know the the violence that it perpetrates the the suffering that it that it inflicts it's not so much what one into you know it's not so much one individual or you know it's not what individuals do or individuals think even it's the way the whole system works and within that system people try to find a way to feel that they're doing the right thing i think in most cases right so people navigate so it, their way through it so it's highly complex, I think. Mm. Out in the community and in my own sort of general life, I mean, yeah. Um, it, sometimes I'm surprised. This is not about what I what happens at work, but sort of just life in general. Sometimes I'm surprised by what I hear. Um, that gosh, I wouldn't have thought this person that I know is feeling that way about this issue. But there's so much. We live in such tense and kind of conflicted times that, in a broad sense, it's not surprising but in a sort of like mm. gosh is that what he thinks you know that kind of thing so a sort of sudden expression yeah. of distrust of muslims or well, know, well yeah i find I'm... personally quite shocking but i shouldn't be surprised that that this mm. you know reaches into even into my cozy guardian reading bubble you know well and i think sometimes it surprises us or catches us out because we're not always aware what the information stream is to people that we know and like um you know we, we're all using different filters and um yeah. if people are receiving different data and different facts um and different yeah. spins on the information then the outcomes can be very different so people that we grew up with and that we yeah. believe we share common values with we can be quite shocked at their opinions depending on what they've seen and, and heard yeah. quite recently I, I think that's right but i think it's yeah. also to do with um, people's own sort of lives and backgrounds and mm. needs and so on you know changing uh, you know we're kind of committed to the idea that we're trying to play our part in changing attitudes yeah but you know you, you don't change attitudes by picking off an issue and doing a bit of myth busting because mm. people's attitudes are part an attitude on one issue is part of your whole way of looking at the world your belief system True the person that you are your identity which is why art i think can be helpful because it can get to the mm. heart of those things yeah no definitely okay and um let's um uh, move on to um uh, to, to hannes are you still with us are you okay you're comfortable hannes yeah i'm here, I'm <laughs> <All> here. Uh... <laughs> so in in your slides you were mentioning uh, arts and the media together and i thought that was really uh, really interesting um, one of our next questions here is, what role is the media playing in magnifying intolerance? Um, first of all, do you agree with that, that 
uh, summary that maybe media is magnifying intolerance and, and how is that being done? Um, you know, particularly in divided societies, the, uh, the media is, is uh, uh, really the voices of the different sides of, of a conflict. Um, and even those that try to cross a bridge still frame that conflict in a particular way. It takes a bit of time to create inclusive frameworks where, where we are fairly representative, represented in a, in a shared media space. Uh, but uh, coming out of civil wars in most of the countries I, I work, the, the media is incredibly divided and reinforce the misperceptions of each other, the inability to hear each other, uh, the stereotypes about each other, not acknowledging um, the foundations of who the others are and where they come from, um, and and you know, and it is it uh, sometimes just like if you look in Cyprus, this simple acknowledgement of the other's history and the other mm. that they exist. And they have they they have legitimate uh, infrastructure, but in a war situation, you know, you from not not acknowledging even the, that I have a grievance or that I have any legitimacy um, on one side or to the other side, and uh, and it takes really a, a long time to. In South Africa, we work particularly, and in Sri Lanka and, and Nepal and Lebanon with newspaper editors and, and journalists to see how do we reframe conflicts, uh, use more inclusive frameworks, mm -hmm. uh, how do we, uh, you know, sets of questions, you know, we try to see uh, particularly the kind of questions that you use as a facilitator and a mediator uh, are excellent questions for investigative journalists as, as well in terms of broken relationships, broken systems, uh, lack of communication, the kind of values they share, uh, their history, their culture, their identities, um, and, and, and each one really probing questions that rather than judging and just keep putting people in different frames, how do we break that frame? Uh, mm. and, and, and that, you know, I, I find some of the most wonderful frame breakers, uh, children, you know, and, and particularly in you know, I, I, I've seen in, in uh, particularly in the Syria refugee camps, where the, the and the Rohingya refugee camps. Uh, but my my experience with the Syrian refugee camps, where the pain is so raw, uh, we once came across a, a little girl. Her father and her mother was killed in front of her. She was four years old. Um, and she, she lost speech, she couldn't speak. Um, and it was drawing that, that pulled her out. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I'm jumping between formal it's media okay. and, yeah. and a child, but uh, for me, you know, the, the narrative of the children has become so important in every war because we sit day in and day out at these negotiations tables. Mm. Um, and, and I really force myself for the last 15 years that I will not remain at the table. I will go to an orphanage and to a refugee camp over weekends to make sure I hear the real narrative. Um, right, unfiltered. And, yeah. The narrative that mm. should reframe the narratives that we just hear the, polit uh, the political mm. negotiators uh, repeat. Which, uh, thank you, and, and it leads us to another question for all of us, really. So we see um, media taking sides um, in, in a conflict. We also see, in supposed peacetime, uh, mass media creating opinions, uh, creating influence as well. Then we've also heard from Hannes there about you know, Charles' drawings being often the raw truth, uh, which leads us to the question, you know, as artists, how can we overcome... Um, media's tilt on intolerance sometimes, or how can we influence the overall perspective? And, and for anyone, so Inga or John or, or Hannes? I, I, can I chip in here? I, yeah. I think this thing about framing, 
which is a word we use a lot nowadays, but it's, it's such an important concept, I think. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm remembering, uh, uh, I've been a little bit involved in, in work around Israel and Palestine as a Jew that supports Palestinians. And, and, and um, one of the things that I think we see so, so often there is how, uh, via, um, how an act of violence will reinforce the divide, will reinforce that hostile framing that, uh, and deepen, deepen the sort of the inability of people in that situation to, to, to kind of, uh, get, uh, to, to see beyond their own tribe and their own perspective and so on. And, you know, um, and I, I'm contrasting that with something I remember happening at some point during the South African peace process, when there was a terrorist act at some, some point in the sort of process from towards, towards elections. Um, and the political response was that it wasn't going to derail the process. So if it was an attempt, as I guess it was, to sort of derail it by, by creating hostility, it failed. And that's because the framing had changed, I guess. So it, it seems to me that, I, I love that, Hannes, I loved your quote. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, um, from the guy who said that we're, we're in the middle where the conflict is at its most intense, because, but we can talk to both sides rather than in the middle in the sense of neutral it's mm. not about neutrality we have our values that we bring to it but we can find a method um that that allows people to be heard within that set of values and it's kind mm. of contradictory you're sort of holding a space where things mm. that things that are contrary to your values can be heard but it is part of those values that they are heard, if you see what i mean so, so may I, I, may I extend your your question, John. So I think can we bring this back to the the role of artists? So how can we put ourselves in the middle, and how can we uh, you know influence the situations around us? Um, Inga, maybe you have some thoughts on this from the things you're seeing as well. If I may, I think um, an example, just a very concrete example. There's there's a Henkelis Thomas who is a conceptual black U.S. based artist who uh, set up a network which is called the Wide Awake. And it's like 17 cultural organizations that united and crowdfunded quite uh, an amount of money uh, to influence elections. And they've been doing demonstrations, they've been using billboards, they've been using social media to get their message out and to get people to go and vote and, and to, yeah, to hear that, that this is important. So I think the same, tools that are being used by the media can also be used um, in a way by artists and in a networked uh, approach where they act together to get sort of messaging um, outside. Um, so yeah, there are multiple examples of these where, where artists um, set up these, these kind of a frameworks to counteract these narratives. One of the things that we did with the Festival Academy is, for example, post blast um, Lebanon to organize, uh, we call it a hotspot, which is kind of, uh, I don't know if it's a good name uh, concerning that situation. But the idea of it was to host a conversation where we invited people from the ground, like Hannes was saying, like to hear, to go to the camps, to hear from the people and to really engage a conversation with an international community to hear from the people who are actually living in Lebanon at that point, what is going on? Because there is a story that is projected through the media, but it's not yeah. all of it. And there is really the, the real life situation and, and there's a lot of, of information that is valuable. And you do that through a sort of connection because we've been there, we did an atelier there, we have friends there. So there is a kind of caring relationship towards these people who go through these crises and to build international solidarity uh, through these connections that, that we constructed in one way or, or another. Mm, yeah. And do you think you that know, there's an opportunity... Was, um, uh, sorry, Hannes, go on, sorry. Uh, you know, what was really striking to me, you remember the, the different people's uprisings last year, 
uh, where people experience really great suffering. Um, where both in the Lebanon one and in the Chile, you remember the Chile one where everybody played violin mm. and singing, and the Lebanon the artists came out and and singing and everybody sang, um, and it, it was really extraordinary there. And and you also you remember the Standing Rock protest of the pipeline in America, uh, where prominent American artists like Dave Matthews and and a whole string of them uh, uh, performed and stood between the protesters and the police. Um, and they eventually, on and off, uh, helped won the people their court case. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, th th this is really musicians standing in the middle and in, in, in mm. an extraordinary, uh, courageous way. Now, yeah, that's a great reference. Okay, um, let me uh, get your reaction to a quote that we came across now as well. This was on um, gulfnews.com. Uh, it was in an article, Islamophobia, why Macron is wrong on the freedom of expression debate. Um, maybe we can pull this quote up on, um, on the stream here. Uh, for anyone listening and not watching the screen, maybe they're listening to a podcast or something later on. I'll also read it out. Um, oh, here we go. It is becoming quite comprehensible and easy to understand now. If you insult women, you are a misogynist. If you insult black people, you are a racist. If you insult Jews, you are anti-Semitic. But here is the deal. If you insult Islam, you are practicing freedom of speech. Um, so that was quite a recent quote from, from Gulf News. Can I get reactions to um, that very prolific uh, quotation from anyone? But maybe if I can, just to say that, that on the answer to how I see intolerance in my private life or my social life, yeah, sure. I think I'm a lot confronted working internationally and globally with my own intolerance. And I do understand the quote in the sense of um, how there is a sort of ruling um, perspective that we, it's just a stupid anecdote, but today I was talking with somebody from the Philippines and she organized the symposium and she said, we announced the times in PST time, which is the, the abbreviation for Philippines time. But of course, everybody thought it was specific standard time. And just to say like how we perceive the world from a sort of, if we talk about decolonization, taking things for granted that are part of the world, is ruling these kind of uh, systems. Mm. Um, and, and this is always about what you take for granted or what you've been raised with. So there is a huge effort, I think, to be done on the level of breaking down our own prejudices, which are often hidden. If, while we think that we are very open-minded, but we do have um, these kind of privileges that we are often not aware of. And that's something I encounter a lot in the dialogues that we have that people say like, yeah, but you as seeing them as not being part of that kind of a world because the circumstances are so different and they don't feel like they are being understood within the context they are they have their daily life in yeah yeah thank you yeah um john you want to make a comment there also well i i think the quote is is apt in general i i mean by which i mean that I think it's often the case that that is true. Mm. Uh, yeah. That 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 um, expressing you know intolerance of 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 Muslims and and sometimes all kinds of uh, I all kinds of hostile ideas about what Islam is like. Is something that has has uh, has 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 a place in the, in main in the mainstream now. Mm, yeah. Um, so I think it's generally true. I'm gonna back, I'm gonna kind of duck the question of whether it's specifically true about what Macron said because I, to be honest, I didn't I pay enough attention yeah. to what yeah. Macron said and, and mm. the context of what he said and 
what people made of what he said and so on. But I think it's generally true that it's okay. Yeah, it's okay to be Islamophobic. You know, it's okay to say that Islam, I don't know. But yeah, so so I think it's I think it's a fair point yeah. in lots of ways. Um, we've made them, uh, we've made Muslims the scapegoat, haven't we, for, for many problems. Um, and someone has said, I can't remember who said it, we, we've made them the other that everybody agrees it's okay to criticize and it, it's not okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, I'm a Jew and Jews have lots of experience of being at the sharp end of that, of course, it seems to me. But then, you know, in the context of the work we do on the around immigration in the UK at Music in Detention, you know, you get yeah. a sense really that there's a sort of rolling program of scapegoat of the month, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah we or... have the, the rhetoric around, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, or I don't know where the hell it was. Yeah, 10 years ago, it was bogus asylum seekers. That was the phrase, you know? Mm. And um, and then we've had, you know, like a series of, of kind of moral panics about othered groups, you know? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Hannes, would you like to comment on, on this quote as well, briefly? Or um, I wish I don't, but I, I you know, I, it, it, I, I thought when he, he said it, it was very insensitive. Um, but it's a little bit like that. You remember that wonderful HSBC adverts in the airport? Um, where the same word and the same things mean different in different cultures, um, mm. and and these are also the expression of you know uh, you experience Islam differently in France. Um, uh, but I also you know I, I look at myself and and how uh, you know coming out of a Christian culture, I, I am a renegade priest who got kicked out of church, and you know I uh, have similar kind of bizarre background that, that uh, Peter had. Uh, and and it's always a shame for me growing up in Africa, how uh, our forefathers and colonial powers have ruined Africa. Um, and then at the same time, we stand on, on uh, have the audacity to stand on, on uh, that we are this, the honorable people standing on rights. And I, I think uh, you know, uh, our values should be embraced with humility um, and kindness and love and compassion and not with self-righteousness. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel if, if these, com you know, and I find myself looking at American Christian right-wing evangelicals under Trump making the same kind of self-righteous comments. And I, I constantly find myself terribly humiliated in my own eyes of just thinking how dare you do that when you are fairly critical of others doing the same and and I, I guess this is really the issue of getting to the heart of tolerance of how do we transform these these uh, um, frames in our own mind and and our own prejudices uh, and and that's where we start with uh, uh, towards our enemy, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, in the peace processes that, that I work in, it's always for me, the transformation of people that are enemies, how do they transform into partners in peace? And in, 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 in the European context or American context or in South African context, is it, how do we, how do we cross these boundaries of of our differences, uh, where uh, despite what we think of the others, that we that we change the way we look, but to start with ourselves, you know, and and not finding constantly uh, a higher ground that we can stand on to judge mm -hmm. others. And I think that's when we, I think the 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 sense of constant disciplined humility. Um, and and that the fact that these are our values doesn't give us the right to start judging and that's mm -hmm. that's the the last thing we should do in becoming the judges of others because we embrace certain values i think uh, yeah. it should make us rather you uh <laughs> humble uh and and mm -hmm. even more committed to to kindness and and openness um mm -hmm. 
anyway. But, uh, yeah, that, that's but, certainly echoing Inga's thoughts of recognizing yeah. your own intolerances. Um, yeah, that's reaffirming. If I could, if I could add something, yeah. um, I think there are kind of two levels in a way to the to the work that needs to be done. There's the political layer, the political sphere, and the human sphere. And what I mean, I, to to illustrate this, I a colleague a colleague of of mine um, was present at a at a city centre demonstration by the um, English Defence League a few years ago, at this time of year, around November, Remembrance. Um, um, and there was the English, English Defence League um, who were Islamophobic. Um, and there was a counter demonstration, both in the same city centre and the police, of course, were keeping, keeping the, two, the two demonstrations apart. And the result of that was that um, the English Defence League were unable to get to the cenotaph in the city centre, mm. and uh, uh, and and my my colleague told me about seeing um, a man who was uh, beside himself with upset and frustration that he couldn't go get to the cenotaph and pay respects and felt that he'd been prevented, you know, by hostile mm. forces from doing so. And the discussion we then had was, how does one respond to that? And the only quest, the only answer that we were able to come up with, and I haven't found an, a, I ha still haven't found an alternative, really. I think, is that in the political sphere, platforms have to be proposed and opposed. And if something is being proposed that is hateful, it must be opposed. But at the human level, we can st we can we can show compassion to someone like that individual, and and engage with why they feel the way they do and how they see the world and what makes them, yeah, what's driving it. Mm. Um, mm. And I think that art can do that human level stuff so well, but um, something we're working on a lot at mid at the moment is to try and do better the job of getting that material, getting the creative results and the stories and so on back into that bigger sphere, that political sphere. Right. Because otherwise it, it can have a powerful impact on those individuals, but that's where it ends. Yeah. So we have to cross between the two. We can act differently in those two layers, but we have to also do something to 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 move material from the human uh, mm. sphere to the political sphere. That's a great point, and uh, we have some guidance from the UN here on the observances on Tolerance Day. So um, we can think about law. Um, that governments should be responsible for enforcing human rights and punishing hate crimes in this. Education, extremely important, we touched on that. Access to information to everyone, so there's freedom of expression, there's uh, you know, press pluralism, individual awareness, um, so you know, people are taking this personally, and then local solutions. So we look at um, individual communities and not just a whole economy or a whole country. Um, I think it's worth, you know, in the closing minutes of our panel discussion, thinking about the arts and, and what art can do, or what is art's role globally in counteracting intolerance. Um, so whoever wants to go first, these are kind of be our, our closing comments about art's role on International Day for Tolerance. So we should make this count. Um, who would like to, uh, to make some closing remarks? And everyone will get a chance, obviously. Who would like to kick us off? Maybe Inga, from your festival standpoint? Yeah, I think humility would be a good starting point, as uh, Hannah said, and, and to refer to John, like the, what he said in the, in the earlier panel, actually, that festivals can create, or, or art can create these safe spaces where um, we can have opposing views or, or differ in opinion. Uh, I think, one of, one of the things that experts agree on these days is that the challenges that we face today in our world are not to be um, solved by one country nor by one sector or one expertise. So I think there's a strong need for international cooperation and cross-sectoral cooperation, as you said, John, to feed back the knowledge that we gather into policy debates, but also to other levels of expertise, philanthropy, foundations, uh, these kind of things. 
And I think festivals in general can be great spaces to lead by example, to give, to, to not go by the norm, to, to give different possibilities or to reimagine how we would like the world uh, to mm. look like and how we would like to live in it together. And the great thing about that too is you create that environment in a, um, an event, an online event or physical event, but then people leave there and go to wherever they came from and influence more people, don't they? And say, oh, this amazing enlightening experience with, you know, this is how we can look at things differently, whether they are so overt about it or just change their behavior that infects other people around them. I think that's great. Okay, um, Hannes, can we uh, ask for your comments, please? So how art is counteracting global intolerance? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the you see so much resistance art uh, during oppression. Um, and uh, I, I saw recently, I wanted to, I couldn't find the picture uh, while we were, I was driving to this other city. Um, but there is a, a, a wonderful drawing of, of one of the kids in uh, Syrian refugee camp um, of hot water, uh, hot uh, air balloons. Um, mm. And it was really fascinating to me, the children's drawings of balloons and stars. Um, and, and when we asked him, is it, they, they, they wanted, they wanted to see the world from up high. They wanted to get out of out, out of where they were, and they were drawing this incredible environment uh, around them. Um, and and uh, when I asked the young girl about the stars, she said, "In my village, the stars were so big, and here the stars are so small. You know, and it's the air pollution, uh, the the light pollution of mm -hmm. a city. The stars are very small within the village, that so you can see them much more clearer." And and I guess that was for me such a such a symbol of of what art, and 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 some of the artists that I grew up in South Africa, the poets and uh, and the uh, wall artists and and the the uh, the theatre of of just those were the visions that strengthened you. Those were the visions that were your oxygen uh, at the time of absolute despair and. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's that's what you know we must keep alive, and you and you see that in every every uprising and in every oppressed situation where where the artists join, you you just feel the spirit lift, you know, and 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 people breathe for a moment, uh, and I think that's such an important thing because during oppression and 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 wars. People suppress the art because it, it, they don't want the people to, they want to control the people. And where art gives spaces for people to be free and breathe again. And, and I think that's such an important role art play in, in these uh, spaces. Mm, thank you. Yeah, that, that's great. Okay, um, uh, John, do you have anything more to add? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, building really on that point about art in re as a form of, you know, resistance and sustenance, I think, I think there's a danger when we talk about um, listening to the other side, you know, and understanding the other side, which I passionately believe we need to do. But the, da the danger in it, it seems to me, is the illusion of a level playing field. Um, there is, every, at the human level, everyone has their view and their beliefs and where they've come from and so on. But at a societal level, there is structural violence and structural inequality. And one of the things that the arts can do is to help people who are little heard or silenced um, to make their voices heard. I think that's a great closing statement. So with that, I thank our guests, um, Hannes, Inga, and John. 
and um, everyone on the Art27 team today for putting this live stream together. Um, you can find us on art27.art, and you can find us on the, uh, the Facebook page of Musicians Without Borders, where you'll find this live stream. Uh, thanks again for, for joining in and your great contributions today. Uh, you've been fantastic guests, and um, I hope our paths will cross again. Thank you. Thank you very much.